We're gonna get started talking about the health aspects of einkorn sourdough sprouted wheat bread. As you remember from other things I've discussed, I got into the entire sourdough baking process from a health perspective. And in fact, I haven't really worked with other flours or other things because I've been focused on the health uh, aspect from a primary standpoint. So overall, we're gonna cover a few topics. Number one, we're gonna cover briefly the idea of metabolism and calories. We're gonna cover probiotics and prebiotics and intestinal effects of our dietary choices. We're going to talk about the paleolithic derivation of wheat and why that might be important for health. And we're gonna talk about in detail, what does einkorn wheat mean? What does sourdough mean? What does sprouting mean? And how might any of these ideas uh, affect our health? And we're gonna talk about, in general, some things about farming and modern uh, methods of agriculture that can also have impacts on health. So beginning very quickly with metabolism and calories. Um, there's been a lot of talk about low carb. I was keto for two years, as I've talked about elsewhere. And then I switched, partly for social reasons, convenience reasons, but partly also because my benefits had plateaued. And I have talked elsewhere about how keto might not be good for some people or might be beneficial for others. But the core concept of the keto diet is the idea that insulin is our primary fat storage signal. The more insulin, the higher the spikes of insulin we generate in our bloodstream, the more our bodies receive the signal to store fat. Um, that lowers our basal metabolic rate. It tends to make us tired so that we move less. It has a variety of other knock-on effects. But one of the benefits of sourdough is that it smooths the absorption of carbohydrates. So the same carbohydrate sourdough bread wheat or wheat processed using sourdough methods will have a smaller effect on blood sugar than the same amount of carbohydrate using uh, standard modern Saccharomyces cerevisiae baker's yeast. And we're going to talk a little bit in detail about why that might be, but just specifically to know that that effect occurs. Whole wheat containing more fiber slows the absorption as well. There is some evidence that sprouting actually also decreases the speed of absorption. That data is a little less reliable. But all of these things in general are intended to contribute to a slower absorption of carbohydrate. That slower absorption means that the maximum peak is never as high. Because the same amount of carbohydrate is absorbed more slowly, the maximum peak never gets as high, and therefore less insulin is generated to control the blood sugar uh, absorption for the same total dose of carbohydrate. Along similar lines, the curve can be blunted by the consumption of fat and protein. So if you eat bread with fat and protein, it will be absorbed more slowly. And just as a uh, brief aside as well, when sugar spikes up high, then insulin has to bring that back down. When it brings it back down, it actually can overcorrect and you can end up hungry again. And that's why often you get these blood sugar spikes followed by eating and fatigue. That low blood sugar feeling is a product of having a too fast an absorption curve in many cases. The other topic I want to talk about is probiotics and prebiotics. We probably hear more about probiotics these days in general media, but they are both based on the concept of the microbiome in our intestine. Much of our digestion is actually not done by our own bodies, but by the bacteria that we keep in our intestines. These bacteria digest carbohydrates, primarily carbohydrates, to simpler forms that can be absorbed. And in particular, there is a fermentation process by which the bacteria convert carbohydrates that we cannot digest, such as fiber, into short-chain fatty acids. Those short-chain fatty acids are the preferred nutrition source for our intestinal cells. So actually our intestines have the food inside them and they absorb sugars, proteins, long-chain fats, and they pass all of that on to the bloodstream. So 
the intestinal cell pulls in nutrients and pushes it off to the bloodstream, but it itself may be starving. Its own nutrition may not be taken care of because typically the intestinal cell's nutrition uh, is from short-chain fatty acids. Those short-chain fatty acids are derived from bacterial products from fiber in the gut. Uh, that's also another critique of the keto diet or relatively low fiber versions of the keto diet um, that are primarily meat-based or fat-based because it is, they can be fiber deficient. It is certainly possible to have a salad-based or plant-based keto version that would be very fiber rich, but many people are not following those versions. So, the probiotic concept is the idea of being able to take in specific bacteria as a supplement to uh, alter or improve the balance of which bacteria are inside your colon. The problems there are, number one, bacteria are killed by stomach acid as well as the, the digestion in the small intestine. And number two, it does not seem that probiotic supplementation effects last beyond the time where you stop taking the supplement. So when you stop taking that supplement, your intestines go back to the way they were. The reason for that is that your bacterial balance is largely determined by your diet. Just like weeds in a garden, if you feed it things that the weeds like, they will continue to grow. If you're able to select a mixture that the weeds don't like, but that other plants do prefer, the content of the yard will naturally shift in that direction. So in this case, we talked about fiber, that's one. The particular types of carbohydrates, fats, proteins, are the other aspect. And by making dietary choices over time, we can gradually shift our bacterial content in one direction or another. One of the practical effects of this, though, is that when you start taking in fiber, you will often end up with an upset stomach or diarrhea or other effects because the bacteria that were in the intestine are now not being fed the way they were, and there is a die-off effect. And so there can be a transition. As you make any dietary change, you can expect some upset stomach in, in many cases for a period of time. The other term I wanted to introduce here is photomap, fructooligosaccharides, that are contents of wheat and other grains are essentially fibers and are digested by bacteria, but in particular, those oligosaccharides can be problematic for some people depending on their particular microbiome content. Last point I wanted to make about the microbiome is that it seems to have effects outside the intestine. And that's something we're just learning about. It's actually quite exciting. There are interesting data on the microbiome content affecting muscle growth rates, exercise response, mood, depression, anxiety, a variety of immune function. Um, so we're just learning about the interaction between us and our microbiome. One of, my, one of my colleagues actually commented that in some ways we are just meat sacks enslaved by our bacterial overlords, which is a, perhaps a dramatic way of putting it, but it does seem uh, sometimes to question which one of us is in control.